60 Minutes producer Henry Schuster on Bellingcat's investigative work in the war in Ukraine. What are you discovering in the Ukraine war? We're discovering the enormity of war for the first time in our lifetime in a, in a way that is near us, uh, the way that we can see it in social media, in Instagram, in uh, TikTok videos. And the volume of war crimes that we believe we're discovering in our daily work is, uh, is overwhelming. Our story this week is about Bellingcat. They're a group that's using the tools of the internet to mine the internet for information and to find information about everything from war crimes, mass murders, and assassination plots, all leading back to the Kremlin. Christo Grozev is the executive director of Bellingcat. The information you're collecting that is exposing the war crimes consists of what? It's almost exclusively open source data. That means publicly available postings on social media, TikToks of uh, kids that are from a village and they see a tank go through and, and, and shoot at the house, or, uh, or a local resident doing their own selfie and behind them is another uh, type of weapon. And I would say that about 70% of the evidence that we are gathering comes from TikTok this time. Elliot Higgins is in many ways an accidental activist. He founded Bellingcat in 2014, and he learned to use internet tools to look at the internet and verify. So geolocation means, was it shot where they said it? Chronolocation is, was it shot when they said it? There are thousands upon thousands of videos coming out. Some are coming out on TikTok, some are coming out on Instagram. A lot of them are being then tweeted. And what Bellingcat is doing is they're doing the same process, geolocation, verification. TikTok strangely become a, a really great source of videos from prior to the invasion. All these videos you are seeing here were posted on TikTok by ordinary Russians who just saw something interesting on the streets, thought they'd get a few likes and share it. But what this is actually showing us is the build-up to the invasion. It's not just the fact that we can see where the vehicles are going. It shows us what kind of military equipment there is. It's possible to identify units from this. There's some incidents, for example, where we know there's been rocket launchers firing from inside Russia, from close to these, where these were filmed into towns that have been linked to cluster munition attacks, for example. What this allows us to do is identify the units and then associate launch sites with those units because we know they're in the area. In some cases, it's actually possible to see these convoys through their entire journey from their base all the way to the border. So all these bits of information give us additional uh, just evidence that we can use for accountability purposes in the future. The name that just about everybody is familiar with, unfortunately, is a place called Bucha, which is a suburb of Kyiv, which has become synonymous with possible war crimes. Mass graves were discovered there after the Russians withdrew. The Ukrainian military and the Ukrainian government say all of this happened while the Russian military was controlling Bucha. Uh, the Russian defense is that couldn't have been us, had to have happened after we left. We wouldn't have done something like that. Well, Scott had a chance to see firsthand what happened in Bucha, just not that long after the Russian military had withdrawn. Eyewitness investigations and eyewitness accounts are extremely important, but to demolish the argument that it couldn't have been us, it had to have been the Ukrainians that the Russians are putting forward, takes a little bit more forensic evidence. So this is the center of Bucha, where we can see a Russian armored co column. It's parked at the road. There's a woman down here pushing a bike around the corner. I can see her. And this vehicle starts firing. This was reportedly filmed on March 3rd. And you'll you've see seen, it starts firing. Shot. Yeah. Yes. Now it's unclear if that was a warning shot or exactly what was going on there. But what we actually have now in this next video, which was filmed a few days after Ukrainian forces entered, oh. is exactly the same location. So that's actually the woman who was shot and her bicycle. in that video. Yeah. Now, we had the Russians claiming that this was all fake, it happened after Ukrainians ent entered, but there was actually a nearby Ukrainian unit who had been sending up drones for several days before these forces entered. And what you can see here, this is the same street. This is actually the location where the woman was killed. You can see the house there was destroyed after that was filmed. You can actually see the bodies there on the ground, very distinct. Bodies all along on the that street. Road. Yeah. And this one is from the 25th of March, so well before Ukrainian forces entered. So the Russians claimed 
that these people were killed by Ukrainian troops after Ukrainian troops came into Bucha. But this video, before the Ukrainian troops entered, proves that they had to have been killed by the Russians. That's correct. And it also gives you a sense of the devastation in the area, the position of some military units and other details of what happened. There are so many critics, governments, uh, world leaders, private organizations, uh, that have criticized the Kremlin. But Bellingcat, when they put something out, the Kremlin usually responds and not in a favorable way. To give you a, a sense of how the Kremlin responds, this is something that Dmitry Peshkov, who is Vladimir Putin's chief spokesman, said about Bellingcat just a few days ago, and I quote, in general, the information of Bellingcat must be perceived through special filters, sometimes with a sense of humor and sometimes as a deliberate lie and distortion of reality, end quote. He's trying to be tongue in cheek, sense of humor, but the Kremlin's not laughing when Bellingcat puts out reports.